Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is a time for everything under heaven. And it's time for the kid from the north end of St. John to say goodbye to the Legislative Assembly in New Brunswick. Mr. Speaker, I'm at peace with this. I've thought long about this. To understand the journey that I've been on over the last quarter of a century, I have to talk a little bit about my family. My dad instilled in me a pride to be from the North End that I never forgot. He also instilled in me the values that you had to leave the community better than you found it. My mom was fiercely partisan. That partisanship was about being part of a political party that was to make a difference. My, I can still remember my mom telling me the story about my grandmother Holder after she married my father. She walked into her living room, passed her a membership card, and said, there you go. You're now officially a member of the Progressive Conservative Party of New Brunswick. <laughs> there was no negotiation. It was just the way it was going to be. In Vera Holder's world, that was how you created change in your community. My mom, I remember going to my first leadership convention when I was 16 years old. I was supporting Hank Myers. She was supporting Barbara Baird Filleter. We walked into the lobby of the Aiken Center, and my mother looked at me and said, okay, this is where we part company. I'll see you at the end of the day. I thought it was my mom's way of telling me that I, I could have a mind of my own. I think she was preparing me for how tough politics could actually be. My wife, Brenda, she married me knowing I was a politician and has stood with me through all of it throughout the years. I could never have done it without her and our two daughters, Margaret and Catherine. And all of us, the four of us collectively, have always had this sense, like my dad, that we had to leave the community better than we found it. My girls were born into a very public family, and they knew it from the time they were old enough to understand. And so for all those weekends in Queens County that never happened, to the curling shots that I wasn't paying attention to because there was some sort of crisis looming. I just want to say thank you to Brenda and to Margaret and Catherine for being there through all of it. You know, I remember there was a time when I first started out. I, was, I grew up in this world of politics around me, and I was passionate about it, and I loved it. And there came this point in my late teens and early 20s where whether it was that I was so passionate about it, whether it was at church, whether it was at school, whether it was in the neighborhood, there was this assumption that I was on a path and it was going to lead to one place and it was right here in this room. I do remember when I was signing up some people for the nomination in 95, there was one lady who I was sitting at her kitchen table and she said, and I thought you were going to be an Anglican priest. I looked her in the eye and I said, well, I thought about that for a brief moment, but I always thought that the politics of the church could be far rougher than anything I would experience in the Legislative Assembly. Well, you'll have to write, wait for the book to see if I still think that's the case. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to highlight two politicians that mentored me in my early days. I've already mentioned Hank Myers. Hank stayed loyal to me to the end. Hank taught me about loyalty, and he taught me, more importantly, the value of working your riding and staying in touch with your riding. My dear friend, Ermini Cohen, she taught me, like my mother, that it was important to be partisan at certain times. But that partisanship ended once the election was over. And there was no clearer example of how I demonstrated that than my relationship and my friendship with the former member from Shediac, Victor Boudreau. Victor and I could tear each other up in the house here. There was one time I, when I was environment minister, I gave a statement 
on uh, compost week. And Victor said, well, that's appropriate because the minister over there sure knows how to shovel compost. <laughs> then there was the time, I think quite eloquently, he was taxing a little too much when he was finance minister. And uh, I called him the sheriff of Nottingham. The headline in the paper the next day was after an extended question period, fur was flying in Sherwood Forest. <laughs> but Victor and I were reminiscing about this over a nice lunch this summer. And what people in this house didn't know was that Victor and I always had each other's cell phone numbers. When I was in opposition, he helped me with my constituents. And when I was in government, I did my best to do the same for him. And that's how this legislature needs to work. As former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney always said, people who don't understand that good friendships and good politics go hand in hand know absolutely nothing about either one. Relationships are how you get things done. I want to quickly talk about my riding for a minute. I have learned far more from my constituents than they have ever learned from me. My friend Percy Mockler once said to me very early on, Always remember that the rich can always afford a lawyer, but many people, their MLA is the only defense they have. I have an incredibly economically diverse riding, and Percy's wisdom served me very well, because our primary concern was helping those constituents plow through the bureaucracy, get things done, and get them help. Just a few quick projects that I want to mention in the early days in the riding, in my first term, and this is all buried infrastructure, and people have long since forgotten it, but there were thousands of homes in the north end of St. John, in Portland Place, and in, in the rifle range that for generations went untreated into the St. John River. And in my first term, I was able to secure funding to upgrade that, that system and to take it to Milledgeville to an upgraded system so it no longer went untreated. And that was before. In my days as environment minister, I was able to lobby for the first level of funding, the first phase of funding for the bigger harbor cleanup project in St. John. Along with my colleagues from Lancaster and, and East St. John, along with Carl Killen and Glenn Tate, we also later on secured funding for the largest municipal infrastructure project in the history of New Brunswick with clean, safe drinking water in St. John. In my first term, I led to have, I worked to have a sizable piece of, of provincial property sold for development out in Milledgeville to create growth. But there was balance, Mr. Speaker. We also took a significant amount of acreage and protected it for the environment for generations to come. My po political career has always been about trying to maintain balance. And if I dare say, Mr. Speaker, it's about being progressive and conservative at the same time. There was the redevelopment of Crescent Valley, which eventually led to a world-class, first-class accessible YMCA on one side of Churchill Boulevard and safe, affordable, mixed-income housing on the other. There was the, the other uh, project in our area along the lines of the environmental stewardship that I've already highlighted. When I was environment minister, I worked with the Nature Conservancy of Canada to turn over a sizable portion of land from Colson Cove to Musquash to protect the Musquash estuary. Mr. Sp the, other, the, the other project that I want to quickly talk about is the playing fields for our high schools. We were the only high schools in the province that didn't have access to their own fields. And we built three of them in Milledgeville, so those high schools, those inner city schools, could have access to them as well. And finally, when I talk about the riding and our diversity, I want to say so, I want to thank my old friend Juanita Black from Crescent Valley, who once said to me, or actually she said it at our nomination when she was nominating me, and I, this was one of the best compliments somebody will ever pay me. She said, that I was somebody that it didn't matter whether you made $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year, that I had time for them. And Juanita, I still pray to God all the time that I 
have lived up to that reputation and that I always will. I want to quickly thank a number of people, to my staff who have served as executive assistants over the years in various portfolios, I.D. Iangador, Nicholas Allette, Elizabeth Fleming, Jana Towers, and to my staff at the riding office, Jason Sully, Tom Sully, Craig Esterbrooks, Paul Stewart, and currently Melanie Bell Hughes. I was re-elected in many ways because of the work that these individuals did for not only me, but for our constituents and for the people of New Brunswick. I want to thank the premiers that I've served under for the opportunity to have served in cabinet three different times and the opportunities that that gave me. And I thank the premier for our conversations over the last number of days leading up to my decision here. I also want to thank, I mentioned um, two people that had worked for me over the years, Melanie Bell Hughes um, and Craig Bell Estabrooks. I have always tried to model myself over our seven-term MP, Tom Bell. Tom was the type of guy that never had necessarily be in the news every day, but he was hardworking, he got the job done, he was the first to show up at a reception, and he was the last to leave. He personified the importance of building friendships and relationships. And I want to say a huge thank you to the Bell family over the years. They have always treated me like one of their own. Both Melanie working in my office and Craig's friendship over the years that I will be, for always, I will be forever grateful for. Very quickly, just a couple of things that I've had the pleasure and the honour of working on during this government. The establishment of working New Brunswick and changing the whole way that we do business and, making, and taking away that cookie cutter approach because of, as I've said many times, what works in St. Gontan might not be what works in St. George and what works in St. George today might not be what works there two years from now. And we created that flexibility. The population growth initiative and I had the opportunity to negotiate a 30% increase to our nominations coming to this province with former Federal Minister Marco Mendocino. I remember the meeting well. We spent the first 20 minutes talking about the Leafs roster. And then he turned to me and said, what is it you're here for? I told him what I wanted. And 24 hours later, he called to say yes. The port modernization was something that I was proud to work on. But more importantly, through the workforce partnership, the the level of labor harmony that we have been able to create on our waterfront. We, because of that, because labor, the employers association, the port and the community are all rowing in the same direction, we have a competitive edge at our port that no other port in North America currently has. <laughs> and finally on that, I would just say, I still believe it is the economic development opportunity of a lifetime. And we can sit back and watch St. John become North America's gateway to the world and the world's gateway to North America. Or we can make sure that it becomes New Brunswick's gateway to everywhere. We can get excited about Mercedes coming and going, and I say this metaphorically, or we can get excited about a Brooklyn coming out of our, out of our port. We need to figure out what the next big ideas are. We need to dream big. We need to think things, think about things like year-round farming and what that can mean for exports in this province and using the port. And finally, I just want to talk a little bit about this house. I have enjoyed working with all of you over the years, regardless of political strife. You know, we may have other jobs in life, some of them may pay more. Some of them may be rewarding. But I can't think of any other job, any other role in a free and democratic society that is a bigger honor than defending your constituents' interests in the New Brunswick legislature. And the fact of the matter is, we don't own the keys to this place. I took an oath to the Crown 
The crown is the embodiment of the people. The people own the keys to this place. And in a free and democratic election, they are free to take those keys back. You know, I have thought long and hard about my time in this assembly. I don't fear too much, but if there's one thing that keeps me up at night, it's that generations coming out of 1945, including my own, have for far, <clears throat> far too often and for far too long taken for granted the democratic institutions that protect that freedom that was fought for by New Brunswickers in uniform that came before us. We all need to collectively work to make this house work. Because if we can't be the stewards of democracy and freedom, then who else will? You know, Mr. Speaker, by divine providence, I have had the privilege of living and working and contributing to one of the greatest corners of this earth. All I ever wanted, along with all of you, was a, help, a chance to help make it better than it already is. I love this province. And Mr. Speaker, I'll let history decide whether my contribution made a difference or not. But as Richard Hatfield once said, at least history will record that I was there. So Mr. Speaker, one last final time, I say thank you, Mr. Speaker.